Hello and welcome back to SOAS Global Challenges Forum. Uh, this event will focus on how COVID-19 has impacted climate change. Our speaker is Esther Stanford Cose. Uh, Esther will talk for about 20 minutes. We'll follow that with a Q&A and uh, please do submit your questions in the chat box and then we will put some of those questions to Esther, see how many we can cover in the time we've got. Um, we are recording the event and uh, sharing it. Um, please uh, do use the SOAS and SOAS alumni hashtags to discuss or follow the event. That's hashtag SOAS and hashtag SOAS alumni. Uh, our speaker, Esther, is a reparations legal expert. She's an interdisciplinary scholar activist. Her disciplines are both legal and historical. She's a public speaker, author, a PhD candidate researcher at the University of Chichester, and she is co-founder of Extinction Rebellion's International Solidarity Network. I'm uh, Dr. Harold Hubam. I am a senior lecturer in global energy and climate policy, and I convene SOAS master's degree in this space. I'm also the deputy director and co-founder of our center for sustainable finance so uh, without further ado i'm going to hand the floor to esther who will speak for the next 20 or so minutes on how COVID 19 has impacted climate change and the climate change debate esther over to you <laughs> thank you uh, greetings everyone uh, yes, so it's good to, to be here, although I can't see anybody, but hopefully you can see me and hear me good. So, okay. So in terms of trying to answer this question, how has COVID-19 impacted climate change? I would say that my response might not be the typical response because I could answer this in a very conventional way in a very clinical way, which is what you would probably find if you were to do any basic research yourselves. Um, but what I want to also focus on, actually more so, are the politics of COVID-19 and its impact on climate change. So we know that um, for us in Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity Network, which is what I'm representing here today. And, and this was founded uh, as a partnership between co-founders of Extinction Rebellion and also African heritage community campaigns, uh, such as the Stop Uma Angamizi Recharge Genocide Ecocide campaign. So it's important for me to say a little bit about who we are as XRISN so that you will understand the perspective uh, that we share. So we have a mandate, as do many XR groups, and our mandate as XRISN, as we refer to ourselves by acronym, is to foster mutually cooperative and beneficial connections with people from existing communities of resistance on the front lines of the climate and ecological crises in both the global south and the global north who are working on environmental justice so that these perspectives of such communities of resistance get represented through our XR UK, Extinction Rebellion UK, and also that there is two-way learning between XR UK and people from such communities of resistance. So the perspectives that I'm going to be sharing are really from such communities of resistance who are disproportionately impacted, not only by the um, incidents of COVID-19, and especially when we're talking about indigenous peoples, but also climate change. So we're going to focus a bit on the politics of that. And what I would say is important for looking at the answer or in attempting to answer how has COVID-19 impacted on climate change, it's important to recognise that there has been uh, what we in XRISN refer to as, uh, you know, the, it's important to look at this question within the echo fascist politics of COVID-19. And so then it doesn't just become a clinical 
issue of health, including the health of humans and also our planetary health, but it also looks at the power relations that structure um, those incidences of, uh, you know, not only dispossession, but also who gets affected by COVID-19 and what the responses, uh, global responses in terms of governments and corporations are. So for us, we're seeing, and this is what we are report, this is what is being reported to us by our communities of resistance in the global south. And just to uh, state, we have three partner networks as XRASN. One is in uh, Abiyala, so-called South America, and that is called XRANA. We have a global south partner network in Africa. Uh, based in Ghana, and that is called XRAN, the XR All African Affinity Network. And we have a partner network in Asia based in India, and that is known as XRANA, the XMR Affinity Network of Asia. And for those communities that we are working with on the ground who are feeding back to us, what they're saying is that we are experiencing uh, an intensification of not only uh, genocide, the ecocide for such communities who continue to be dispossessed, but also in terms of state responses to tackling uh, COVID-19, we're seeing um, uh, responses that are disproportionate, increasingly militaristic, and what they have argued is eco-fascist. And so really what I wanted to touch on is the root causes of what we're seeing as the weaponization of pandemics such as COVID-19, but also others in terms of the deployment and perpetration of crimes of genocide and ecocide against peoples of the global south. And the root causes of such are colonialism, okay? And the increasing uh, coloniality of power, which continues to dispossess indigenous peoples, African heritage peoples, Asian heritage peoples, of not only their land and their resources, but also their power. And this is important because when you have populations that are dispossessed, it means that they do not necessarily have the internal mechanisms to resist what we're seeing in terms of the increasing um, uh, pandemics, uh, you know, which are of zoonotic origin. Okay, so that is really my starting point. And what we know is, in terms of COVID-19 and other zoonotic diseases, these are diseases caused by bacteria, uh, viruses, fungi, or parasites that spread from animals to humans. And we know that they can be transmitted through direct physical contact, via air or water, or through an intermediate host like insects. So often these zoonotic pathogens do not just affect the animals in which they reside, but they can also represent an enormous risk to humans who have not developed a natural immunity to them. We know that nearly six out of every 10 known infectious diseases are transmitted by animals and a staggering 75% of new and emerging diseases detected in the last 30 years originated in animals. And these zoonotic diseases have been a significant contributory factor for all recent outbreaks and pandemics that have threatened not only our global human health, but planetary health. So in fact, COVID-19 is just one example of the rising trend of such diseases uh, that have jumped from animals to human populations. And we know that other examples are Ebola, um, bird flu, uh, what's known as Middle East Respiratory um, Syndrome, MERS, Rift Valley Fever, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, which is SARS, West Nile Virus, Dengue Fever, HIV, and even Lyme Disease. However, the emergence of the coronavirus is not unrelated to the climate and biodiversity crises 
that we are also experiencing. Now, the loss of species habitats also increases the likelihood of novel zoonotic diseases as they are called. So climate change, so there's an impact in that climate change is a primary driver of many of the emerging zoonotic illnesses which originate in animals. However, as I've already emphasized in my introduction, the zoonotic transfer has been established in between animals and human beings is not just a thing that is happening now. It's actually been established centuries ago. So this transfer from uh, animals to humans is far from new. It's a repetition of the old violences, which have become new violences and dispossessions of extractivism or extractivist plunder, as some of us would prefer to say, colonial expansion and also animal commodification. And this is very much connected to the rise of empire, okay? So these violences continue to be and remain the status quo, for which there has not been effective remedy or repair or even decolonization. And why is this important? because we see that those most impacted, as I said, in terms of those that we work with on the front lines of the climate and ecological crisis are also the ones that have been impacted by these colonial dispossessions that have you know, affected their group efficacy and ability to resist uh, such uh, zoonotic diseases. And what we have also seen is in terms of the continuum today, and in fact, uh, within XRISN, we have a, a strong African heritage community contingents around the world. And there's a term that gets used as the Ma'angamili, it's a peak Mahili term, which means the African Holocaust. And what we have seen in terms of uh, not only land dispossession and land grabs, we know that forests which are being disrupted, which are being impacted, uh, are also being a part of, if you like, this extractivist plunder. But these same forests continue to play an invaluable role in combating climate change, maintaining healthy ecosystems, and also contributing to the prosperity and the well-being of not only contemporary generations, but future generations, so long as these resources are sustainably managed. But the politics of this is that powerful nations of the global north in particular have been able to implement their will through the misuse of law. And in this regard, it's important to recognize the dominant global legal order which has legalized extractivist plunder and destruction of the environment as part of normal business approaches to so-called development, which of course has been contested by many indigenous peoples and peoples of uh, com communities of re uh, resistance in the global south. Now in terms of the drivers of climate change, it's easy, and we often hear, and this is why I mentioned eco-fascist responses, that, well, there's too many people, and it's people in the global south who are having too many children, and the whole question of overpopulation. But we know that that narrative is, is not only racist, but imperialist and colonialist, and it actually uh, disregards the fact that the perpetrators, those who are responsible, are actually very few, especially when we know that it's just the hundred companies that have been the source of more than 70% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions since 1988. So this is why it's important to talk about the politics, because if we don't talk about the politics, then we won't be able to get to the effective responses. And there's so many other studies that have been done. So a key part, in terms of this, uh, what is so-called development, which is really maldevelopment and the destruction of forests and natural habitats, we are then seeing this increase of zoonotic diseases, okay? Now, 
this is significant in terms of the impact because about 1.6 million people, including over 2,000 indigenous peoples, rely on such forests for their livelihoods. They are also one of the most biologically diverse ecosystems that we have on land. And these forests are home to over 80% of land-based species of animals, insects, and plants. Now, why I mention the colonial um, dimensions of this are that a century ago, only 15% of the Earth's surface was used by humans to grow crops and raise livestock. Today, more than 77% of land, excluding Antarctica and 87% of the oceans have been modified by the direct effect of human activities. Now, according to a UN science panel, the policy and platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services between 1980 and 2000 alone, 100 million hectares of forested land was converted into agricultural land in the tropics and some 10 million hectares of forest about the size of Iceland across the world were estimated to have been lost each year between 2015 and 2020. Furthermore, according to a 2020 briefing, two pandemics at once, COVID-19 and illegal forest activities by Dr. Fedor Lezianowska, who's actually based at SOAS, illegal forest activities from logging to mining metals across the world have increased since the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic, especially in forest rich communities and countries in the global south. He cites the results of satellite images and drones deployed by civil society organizations, which show a significant increase in illegal logging and other resource extraction activities, including poaching, endangered species and mining valuable and critical metals, especially gold and cobalt. For example, a total of 1,202 square kilometers of forest, an area more than 20 times the size of Manhattan, for example, was wiped out in the Brazilian Amazon from January to April of 2020. And from January to June of 2020, Illegal mining destroyed 5,510 acres of forest inside conservation units and 2,510 acres inside indigenous territories. So, in my wrapping up, what I think is important to recognize is that the incidences and the intensification of more and more zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 uh, are being spread because of this demand for land and resource extraction. And it will only increase if we do not fundamentally change the way that those uh, who are the most powerful actually relate to nature, but that also impacts on all of us. So if we really want to tackle and look at the root causes of COVID-19 in terms of climate change and its impact on climate change, we have to be brave and courageous enough to tackle root causes. And the root causes look at not just the manifestations or the symptoms, but what has caused these symptoms and what do we need to do to be part of repairing and redresses these, the redressing these historical injustices that impact on us today. And by way of um, you know, the final comment that I think it's important to make, these communities of resistance that I've mentioned, and in particular that we in XRISN are working with, for them the solution is about repair, reparations, reparatory justice, but holistic repair. Okay, now when the, the term reparations is used, it's often just reduced to uh, financial compensation, 
But essentially, repairing is about first stopping that harm, that harm that is continuing, and that harm which many uh, end up being complicit in. And, and it's interesting that I'm giving this talk to Major Sawatz because one of the things that I would say we've seen is that even in terms of the intellectual defense and justification for the continuation of this neoliberal um, extractivism, it often happens in so-called academic institutions. So there is a huge responsibility that knowledge producers have to be part of the solutions. And when I talk about holistic reparations, I'm referring to the process of repairing and remaking not only of the people that have been oppressed and experienced historical contemporary injustice, but doing so because there is a recognition that those same people are in the process and practice of repairing, renewing, and remaking the world. And it is that bold solution that we require, a remaking of ourselves, a remaking of the world, but also a remaking and a redressing and a repairing of how we relate to the natural environment. And uh, we refer to uh, planet repairs in Extinction Rebellion International Solidarity Network as this global interconnected movement of movements to not only reclaim our humanity, okay, but also to restore rightful relations with uh, our Earth Mother. And a key solution that Indigenous peoples themselves have been working towards that we must find ways of supporting is proper decolonization. And I don't mean the way that decolonization has been popularized in a lot of uh, uh, universities uh, you know, around the world that is disconnected um, from actually the struggle to not only revitalize, but restore indigenous people sovereignty as on in America scholars actually argue. And uh, you know, true decolonization means an end to the settler domination of life, of lands, of peoples in all territories of the world where there have been colonized and dispossessed peoples. And it also recognizes that we owe a huge debt to indigenous peoples, First Nations of the world, who for centuries have not only been resisting, um, you know, various forms of extractivism and extinction, forms of extinction, but have also shown the way in terms of how we can live more harmoniously uh, with our Mother Earth and also all our living relations in a way that doesn't upset the natural balance that ends up impacting not only on our personal health, but our planetary health. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther, for a very impassioned uh, presentation. Um, I will start off with a, with a question and I would invite all of our attendees to write your questions into the chat, please. I'm sure there's quite a few things that you would have picked up on from the presentation or indeed other questions that you might have that Esther can speak to in this very broad and yet also very focused uh, debate um, around not just COVID-19 and climate change, but the uh, much bigger discourse that Esther uh, um, illustrated in our or in her presentation uh, here today. So uh, I'm going to follow up on what you were discussing uh, towards the end, Esther, in terms of the solutions and thinking through how to empower those who are powerless uh, at the moment or, or you know, who are most susceptible to, to COVID-19, to other diseases, but not just in, in terms of health diseases, but also the pressures mm. of, of the world as it is. And you, you pointed to a few uh, um, um, examples of of indigenous peoples uh, showing the way and 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 then showing how things can be done because you have two two debates really you've got the, the global discussion mm -hmm. of power shifts and addressing these things and then you have the more localized discussion from the bottom up which also needs to happen perhaps you can uh, illustrate some of these uh, some more examples of how you think this this the shift can be can be made uh, made real 
in uh, as, as we go forward uh, into the 21st century. Okay. <laughs> Thank it's a very you. big question, actually. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. You know, um, that's a really great question, actually. And um, I'm thinking about we need to recognize the big picture in terms of that framework and the structural dimensions of what we're talking about but also recognize the what i would say are the global solutions that people are working on so people are organizing locally but they are doing so with a global perspective and recognizing that the root causes of the issues that they are seeking to tackle and the particular struggles that they may be waging um, have, have global impacts and dimensions. And, uh, you know, many people have been hearing about um, the so-called Green New Deal and different variations of that. And actually there was an alternative that was posed um, by indigenous American uh, communities of resistance in uh, North Abiyala, North America, and they came up with something called the Red Deal. And I'm pointing to this as an example because it has some principles that I think are very relevant here. So what they, there are kind of four main pillars. The first one is to, to analyze, to assess, to be very clear on what creates a crisis, cannot solve it, okay? So that is in terms of the paradigms that we're working with, okay? What creates a crisis cannot solve it. Secondly, it's about recognizing that change must come from below and move, it's saying to the left, you know, whatever those changes are. Because in when we're talking about global challenges, there's often, the, the level of discourse is often above people's heads they don't necessarily see how they can connect to it in terms of their own agency and what role they can play because the focus is on what governments should or should not be doing and are not doing or what corporations are doing and so forth. So recognize the power and the agency of communities who are communities of resistance, but they are developing resiliencies. They are finding alternative ways and, 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 and modes of operation that, that kind of conflict with, contravene and resist the dominant kind of hegemonic order. So that's important. Third, um, the principle around politicians can't do what mass movements do. So these global communities, which might be isolated, detached from each other, but working in similar ways, doing what they can, okay? But also these communities link in terms of wider movements, whether we say global justice movement, environmental justice movements, social justice movements, reparatory justice movements. And the fourth principle is about moving um, this conversation around the impact say, of COVID-19 on climate from theory to action. So there's a lot of analysis around what the problem is and what the problem has been. There's not enough focus on what people can do and are doing. And sometimes those are not big picture things. So um, that might not necessarily answer your question, but I think for me, it's a good starting point. And um, a key point, I mean, this Red New Deal is, it's not to conflict with the Green New Deal, but what it's saying is that the Green New Deal frameworks don't go far enough and that we have to go beyond just a, a, gradual, a sort of gradual um, reformist attempts to really looking at tackling and disrupting, undermining um, structures of power and domination, um, structural um, uh, power and domination that impact on communities and, and prevent them from exercising their agency. And also, you know, stopping extractivism. Yeah, we, all the science, the science is out there, the indigenous, indigenous knowledges are out there, which, you know, and we know the harm that is being caused, but yet business as usual. And I think for those of us who are citizens in these kind of countries, um, so-called liberal democracies, we have to do more to hold our government supposedly 
and corporations to account. So, I mean, I just take the specific example of, say, Africa, the continent of Africa. And despite the fact that the British government is paying lip service to tackling the climate and ecological crisis, what we're seeing is that a lot of trade deals are being signed right now that are actually increasing extractivism in not only Africa, but other parts of the global south. So, uh, you know, there was a, a report that UK taxpayers are funding African fossil fuel projects worth over 750 million uh, pounds. And at the uh, UK Africa summit, energy, most of the energy deals were in fossil fuels. So this is the problem. As, as, as taxpayers, as citizens, as global citizens, we also have power. And um, that power is best exercised collectively, but there are things that we can each and every one of us do, whether we're lobbying, whether we're you know, in joining campaigns, whether we're joining movements, whether we're supporting um, activist groupings and even NGOs. And I think whilst many NGOs may do a good job, we can't just stop at the level of NGOs. It's important to recognize that there are, um, you know, indigenous formations, diaspora community formations, organizations that are trying to build the alternative. And I think our role is to help amplify the voices of those who are struggling on the ground, who are giving us this counter narrative and look at how we can best support that. For students, those who are in, in you know, producing knowledge, there's a huge role to play because as I said in my talk, there's a lot of uh, intellectual justification and complicity of the ideas that get promoted around the world of what so-called development is and, and so forth. And I think everybody therefore has a role to play in terms of assessing how much are we part of the problem and how much are we part of the solution. I wanted to follow up with a question that ties, ties into this that uh, has come up in the chat about the steps that policymakers, decision makers in the global south should take or can take to stop or help stop the spread of zoonotic diseases, but also to push back against the things that you so rightly challenge and identify, because often they might find themselves in, again, this is the question of powerlessness and, and, and power, a somewhat yeah. more powerless position. What can the policymakers do in those affected countries? So uh, that, that's another interesting question. And I think for me, I have to look at it in two levels. So. There, there, there might be a tendency to just see, okay, the whole of the global South is oppressed and, um, you know, just almost victims, okay, and not to recognize the resistances. But it's also important, in my view, to, to look at the complexities of our societies in the global South and to know that many of um, the people from below, which is why those principles from the Red New Deal really resonate with me, are trying to resist, you know, the extractivist policies of their so-called national governments. But, and so we can't absolve them. That's the point that I'm trying to make in terms of responsibilities. Now, if we look at these governments though, outside of a context of recognizing neo-colonialism and think, well, oh, you have sovereign states or, or what have you, then we're gonna miss the plot as well. Because what we see is that many of these governments are actually still locked into neo-colonial relationships that dictate how they govern their societies, okay? So what policymakers, in my view, in these global South governments need to do is they need to, you know, be on the right side of history or our story. They need to stop repressing and oppressing populations because, as I said, there is a direct connection between the way that power gets extract, uh, you know, gets exploited and gets um, transported and externalized in terms of these neo-colonial relationships. And it becomes profitable to suppress those communities that are resisting land grabs, that are resisting the private military contractors of corporations. And, and, and actually, 
are experiencing huge, um, you know, violations of their human and uh, their people's rights as a result of doing so. So I think we have to complicate the, complicate the discourse and the analysis and recognize that just like I'm talking about complicity, uh, you know, of academics or those, you know, within uh, intelligentsia, I'm also, it's also important to recognize modern day complicity of some governments, policy makers, government officials in the global south. And that must also be resisted because what we're seeing is, uh, as I said, especially with COVID-19, they are imposing um, uh, militaristic, militaristic responses to addressing a pandemic of COVID-19 that is trampling on the rights of their peoples. And the only answer that is being offered is take a vaccine. And when people are resisting lockdowns and so forth, that kind of power of the neo-colonial nation state gets deployed against them in a very terroristic way that doesn't always or necessarily happen in the global north. So we have to recognize this nexus of power or the coloniality of power that is genocidal and ecocidal and that some within our societies also profit from that. That's part of the analysis that I think needs to be introduced. There's an interesting question around coming up in the chat around uh, soft power and in soft power and climate negotiations that some countries in the global south have used quite successfully in AOSIS and least developed countries, or at least to an extent successful, of course, we're not where we need to be when it comes to climate change, that much is obvious. Mm. But uh, but you using this in the absence, perhaps, mm. of having hard power, uh, mm. if we define it in, in those more traditional terms, mm. I was wondering what, what your thoughts are on this as using the soft power vehicle, perhaps, to get to uh, a, a, a better place and then build on from there. Definitely. I think all of these um, approaches work. No one of them, not one of them in isolation will be sufficient. And uh, within Extinction Rebellion, uh, Extinction Rebellion has been advocating uh, global citizens assemblies as well as forms of, you know, participatory democracy from below, from the ground up that are, for me, um, manifestations of also utilizing soft power that is not just state based, because ultimately, um, uh, the states and uh, some of them still have, you know, relative uh, powerlessness in terms of the global uh, mechanisms of so called governance. And unless we can find ways to conscientize peoples, okay, because the states themselves cannot do it by themselves, it's peoples that have to be um, catalyzed in terms of ensuring that whatever resistances they are engage, engaged in brings about the transformations in the societies that people want to see, but also um tackles all of the incidences uh, where this will be happening and in certain of our um you know home continents but it, they're so expansive in terms of territories as i said states themselves cannot do it by themselves so i agree soft power is useful um but ultimately uh, what I'm trying to get across here is that it has to be what I'm advocating is a radical solution. And by radical, what I mean is tackling things at the root, which is the root of the term radical, not cosmetic fixes, because people are dying right now. Whilst in, in the UK and other places that where they're declaring uh, climate emergencies, they're talking about something that could happen 10, 15 years ahead. What we're seeing right now is this uh, intensification of global um, ecocide and genocide impacting on communities of resistance in the global south. So where we see the destruction of our environment and the and, uh, habitats, we also see the destruction of the peoples and the cultures that have sustained um, equitable, harmonious relations as well. So where you get genocide, you also get ecocide. And I think we have to learn to be able to see the two together. There's a question in the chat around this transition to a low carbon future, renewables, 
and that build out of you know not just wind and solar but also say electric vehicles and the batteries and the metals and minerals and this transition consumes an awful lot of resources and many yeah. of those resources which you I think refer to in your yeah. presentation as well are mined and extracted in the global south isn't it this strange situation we may find ourselves in that we want to address climate change through renewables and you know other technologies and yet we might exacerbate some of the things by doing so exacerbate some of the things that, uh, that that are so challenging and problematic that you flagged up in your presentation how can Absolutely. we Absolutely, this. absolutely. Um, so that is the issue. That that is the point about extractivism, and where, if we think about uh, that, you know, okay, let me start again. Um, what we in XRISN, at XRISN advocate is um, a globalization strategy. Yeah. So we don't just look at uh, renewables in terms of us living in the global north. We also look at what are the impacts of the policy and so-called solutions in terms of renewables, what are going to be the impacts of the communities where those minerals, resources that we're going to be relying on, um, you know, come from, okay? And so a lot of, and that's why I mentioned about the genocide and ecocide, because in terms of um, you know, dispossessing indigenous peoples of lands, that's still continuing. But these are what's called greenwash, you know, these are greenwash solutions. And we have to be able to, to, to recognize the distinction. And ultimately, there hasn't been true, if there's not true decolonization, it means that resources are being pillaged, you know, plundered from the most uh, disempowered and still oppressed peoples. Um, to, to give us a sense of, oh, we're solving climate change, when really we're not, we're exacerbating it for those communities, those peoples, those nations, those groupings, and not only those of us who are living today, but, you know, for generations to come. And so it might seem as though it's, um, uh, you know, pipe dream or pie in the sky, but decolonization, decolonization that is linked to um, abolishing forms of settler colonialism because whose whose resources are being utilized to create renew you know in terms of all the batteries for electric cars where is it coming from do we recognize the human and people's rights abuses that are going on in terms of indigenous communities who have traditionally lived in particular areas where this mining is happening, where these forests exist, where deforestation is happening. That is what we have to grapple with. That the very order, I think, of the global relations and how we've come to live and what has come to be considered um, acceptable is, is something that must be fundamentally transformed because it's broken. Yeah, so we can't have this piecemeal sort of, you know, fixes and think we're changing anything. So it has to be in tandem. And we have to be able to learn from, have the humility to learn from and listen to what people are saying on the ground. Yeah, because a lot of this um, fossil fuel, um, you know, intensification that we're seeing is not being um, pushed for by governments in the global south or peoples in the global south, I should say, to be more precise. It is something that is still very much a need for those in the global north who have a greater responsibility to stop this harm at source and to support those movements of resistance and repair and restoration and decolonization of communities in the global south. So in this, uh, I suppose you, you refer to this earlier and quite a few times actually, universities do pl play a role in, in, in setting this scene for this important debate to yeah, happen yeah. And, and the stage as well for the debate to happen, not just universities, of course it needs to go much broader than that. Yeah, in terms of knowledge producers, yeah, at yes. all levels. Mm -hmm. So there's a key question here in the chat around, and quite a big question, but as knowledge producers, how should universities best engage with proper decolonization? Okay, so I think it's important for universities to engage with 
original research with indigenous communities to learn um, not only about their resistance, but also to support their own attempts to be part of repairing the harm, okay? To learn, because a lot of what we learn in these institutions, I mean, that's why you have decolonized movements, and I know SOAS has one, but a lot of what we learn is still very filtered knowledge. It's not necessarily coming from the indigenous peoples, and there are, um, you know, notions of knowledge democracy, uh, recognizing the indigenous kind of um, pedagogical institutions of uh, indigenous African Asian heritage communities in particular. And there has to be a recognition of uh, pluriversality, a plurality of knowledges. And I think even going beyond the model of what is a university to look at a multiversity, these are some of the um, solutions that have been offered from the global south. So the fundamental way that we come to engage with, create and co-produce knowledge has to change. Um, and that can only come from a place of having academic humility to recognize that, you know, wherever we stand is a particular type of knowledge, but it must kind of, um, it, from a cognitive justice perspective, and actually uh, it's already been recognized that you cannot have global justice of any type without global cognitive justice because the colonial project was also about dispossessing people of their knowledges and actually pushing uh, a form of knowledge that legitimized conquest, colonial plunder and extractivism. So find out what the real formations are within communities, learn from them, do this in original research, um, establish um, community, university partnerships that promote co-production and also models of research such as action learning much more of that within the university um, setting as well those are some of the things that are already happening that i think can be replicated and strengthened there's a question in the chat that uh, follows on from this very nicely um, it's about colonial histories impacting environmental sciences and shaping its future. And the, the question here is what sort of questions should we be asking? Who should we be asking these questions for if you take environmental science? But you, of course, you can also go beyond that and you can go into the social sciences. So once we know that we need to do things a certain way and approach them differently, what are the sort of in our research, what are the sort of questions we should be asking? If it's possible to. Yeah. So fundamental question is you know for me it's recognizing it's also about the, the what kind of research that we're doing because a lot of the research that happens in these type of institutions is very extractivist okay so people go out they seek information you know from communities and it's extracted and then it's analyzed and it's represented in a way that can get people whatever <laughs> qualifications they need to get and um, you know publish you know publications and so forth so some of the questions for me are about recognizing what knowledge is and whose knowledge counts and recognizing the different types of knowledges that we might not even see as being knowledge that must come into play okay so who is being impacted who is most um impacted by the decisions including the, the 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 knowledge decisions that we make in terms of how we structure our research and also how do such communities who are impacted how can there be more equitable sharing and reciprocity as opposed to extractivist research what are communities going to get as a result of, you know, even my advocacy of original research? What are communities going to be left with? How are the knowledge systems of such communities going to be embraced within institutions like SOAS? Yeah, that, those are some of the fundamental questions that I think need to be answered. And, and there's a methodology um, 
that's called, I, I can't remember the advocate of it, but it's a, a, a sort of feminist methodology, uh, methodology that's called what's the problem represented to be. And what it does is it asks us to just keep going back. So, okay, if we're talking about COVID, what are the core, you know, what is the impact of COVID-19 on climate change? We can give a very clinical technological answer, but then we keep going back and asking why, how, who, but digging deeper and deeper in terms of what we think is the problem, who we think is responsible for the problem, how we think they're responsible for the problem and what we feel that whoever needs to do about it. I think a more general point that speaks to this, I think, is that in research, we should aim to ask how and why questions more rather than only the what, the what questions, being able to describe what's going on, but actually trying to figure out why these things are happening. That's not always easy research yeah. because it requires very, you know, in-depth, uh, uh, working at the source to establish that causal chain, but it's uh, it's very valuable, uh, valuable research. Absolutely. Going back to going back to the point on extraction uh, um, of resources, there was a question in the chat which I think speaks to both the global south and the global north actually, mm -hmm. and it is about whether you think sustainable extraction is possible. Mm -hmm. Is sustainable extraction possible? And really, is is there any kind of extraction ever uh, uh, sustainable uh, in in many ways? What can we do about that? What would that look like in your view? Sustainable extraction, is that possible? I do not feel, I personally don't believe that's possible. Um, but that might seem like an absolutist, uh, absolutist view. And it has been advocated that there needs to be much more um, consideration of notions such as fair and informed consent that is already there in terms of a right of indigenous peoples, but not peoples who are not classified as indigenous peoples. And also communities themselves um, need to be able to be more in the forefront of decision-making about how extraction happens if it needs to happen at all. And, um, you know, as opposed to this corporatization approach where a lot of resources get extracted and um, externalized, okay, to another place where there's, you know, manufacturing or what have you done. So as a as a middle as a stopgap, it it would have to be uh, measures that can try and make the, the the current system happening in a much more fair way. But ultimately, it has to be about stopping extractivism because the harm, you see that if, if we're just looking at ourselves as human beings, that's one thing, but then when we recognize, and this is the thing about learning from and going back to our own selves, especially even those of us who come from communities in the global South and we're diasporas in the global North, we also have to rediscover our own ways and our people's ways and knowledges because this type of extractivism did not happen. And even in the past, I can speak especially as a, a, an African woman, when we wanted to take from anything in nature, there had to be particular rituals and prayers and supplications done because there was a recognition that you would be upsetting the natural equilibrium. And this is where I think we're seeing in terms of the rise of indigenous nations and governments, governments in South Abiyala, where they are going back to their indigenous cosmovisions and recognizing that Mother Earth that, you know, sustains all our lives across our different nations uh, has rights too. It's not just us as human beings. And our Mother Earth has a right not to be pillaged and plundered and have the bowels, you know, her bowels extracted, you know, and now in terms of mineral, uh, you know, deep sea mining and so forth, it, it's just going to another level. And the mindset, you know, that uh, indigenous peoples call a Wetiko mindset, um, African heritage communities, some of them refer to as a Yorubu mindset, that mindset we're seeing um, you know, being externalized now to other planets. So there's talking about colonizing even Mars to get other resources. After so much destruction has been done on Earth, 
And we must, we must, and this is why the struggle for repair is also about a struggle for rehumanization. Yeah, rehumanization, where we actually can take stock of what we're doing and how we're living and at what expense. And, you know, we can't separate ourselves as humans from our environment because we recognize that all of nature is sacred. And that is how traditional indigenous peoples, um, Aboriginal communities, African heritage communities, some Asian heritage communities have lived for millennia. But these are the ways that were, you know, uh, deemed to be um, uncivilized, and uh, you know, people were miseducated to think that they were backward. And now, all of the global institutions and the UN, etc., different departments have uh, come to acknowledge that we owe a huge debt uh, to indigenous peoples and ind indigenous knowledge systems who have been leading the way for centuries. So, you know, the writing's on the wall. We have a choice about what our future will be. And we have to make the right decisions, not just for ourselves, but for future generations, because we are, you know, we are borrowing from the freedom accounts of those future generations. Perhaps for just the last couple of minutes, a final follow on to what you've just said. And a question in the chat asked whether there is time to reverse the damage or a way to reverse the damage and how. Now, of course, we know that much of the damage that's been done cannot necessarily yeah. be reversed, but we have to find a new way, a new settlement, as it were. But perhaps trying to respond to that question, do we have time to reverse some of it when it comes to climate change, when it comes to extraction and the impact on indigenous peoples and communities? And, and how do we go about that? It's not for two minutes. That's a very so, big question. So, so do we have time? We have two, another two minutes. We don't, so. we don't have time. We don't have time. But if I, if I step into a mindset of an African person as an indigenous person, we recognize time as cyclical. So time is both past, present and future at the same time. And that is why I can say we don't have time because whatever we're doing now is actually um, confining or consigning some of us to, to you know, future um, you know, dispossessions and, um, you know, impacts to our not only personal but planetary health that are going to be destructive for human beings as we know and human civilization as we have come to know it. But I don't want to leave people with that doom and gloom, which is often comes because the way that Indigenous peoples relate to this question is that we recognize that because our, our time structures are interconnected across generations, that we know that we carry within us the wisdom of the ancestors. And we, in you know, the African tradition, we talk about Sankofa, so we take the best from our past to now guide us in the kind of decisions we need to make now. And indigenous uh, peoples of the Americas talk about the seven generations principle. So whatever we do now, we have to know that it will impact, or what impact, question, what will be the impact seven generations from now? And if we were to all embrace that kind of indigenous thinking, I think that we would recognize that there's a lot more that we can do and have to do in the here and now. There's a very powerful take on time as we are now out of time <laughs> for, for this session. Uh, Esther, I want to give you uh, the final word, a sentence or two for the attendees that you want to leave everyone with in addition to what you've already already said and shared with us today. So I think it's really important for those of you who are participating, listening, um, do more to engage with communities of resistance. And we can do that even here. There's so many diaspora communities um, you know, that are connected to home, wherever home may be in the global south. And, you know, don't be afraid to take that journey. Don't be afraid to have that academic humility to recognize that you can also be taught in a different way and you can learn in a different way. And ultimately, 
think about the kind of um, impact and legacy that you want to live and how you want to be remembered in, in history or in our story. <laughs> Those are my final comments. So internationalist solidarity, which is what we advocate in the XRAFN, Internationalist Solidarity Network of Extinction Rebellion is key. And solidarity is not about helping people, it's about recognizing that we have a common struggle, but people wage it on different fronts and in different ways. And collectively we can do our bit. Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you, Esther Stanford Gosai, and thank you also to thank all the attendees. Remember that you can follow the series using uh, hashtag SOAS and hashtag SOAS alumni. This recording uh, will be posted uh, on SOAS YouTube channel and on uh, social media pages. So do feel free to watch it back or to tell your friends about the event if they have an interest in this topic. And really it is such a broad and important topic. Uh, we should all be thinking about, about these issues. So thank you very much for this session and this is it. <laughs>